Good question. We have to do something to change what's happened over the last 25 years, obviously. BCRT is a really important part of that. It does take money. You know that if you look at um, NIHR, so that's NHS funding and partners funding of whom we are one. Uh, last year they spent about half a billion pounds on cancer research, okay. and of that only 373,000 went to bone cancer. So that's, a really, that's quite a small amount in the grand scheme of things. Although I haven't checked the figures out, I bet most of that was ours. So I think actually putting some money in is really important. Um, that's going to make a um, that's going to make a huge difference. Uh, other than that, I, I'm a great fan of innovation as a structure. We can need to, if we're going to shift the paradigm. We have to innovate. And that means we have to think outside the box, not to worry, you know, not to risk a kind of hackney, use that hackney term, but that means we have to look at ways in which we can come up with new ideas and we need to build the structure in which innovation can occur. So the sort of things I want to see is doing is building partnerships and networks between uh, researchers and uh, different centres and so on. And I think the patient voice is what these are is really, really important. And you've seen some of that today with PPI stuff. So, oh my God, I think that's what we have to do. Uh, 206, depends on how many you count for a change <laughs> during life. She asked me that last time and I the answer. Embarrassing. Can I just remind you that this again is being filmed, Craig? Oh, yeah, thanks. No swearing. Of research, and what is BCRT doing to meet these challenges? Um, what are the challenges? Uh, so, okay, so we talked about money and we talked about research, right? And um, you know, we talked about what it is that BCRT does. I mean, I said before, I think research support is important, information is important, research is critical, nobody else does that, right? And that's where we can make a difference. The challenges are um, raising money. Yeah, and the second challenge is spending it and spending it in the right way. And we've um, we're trying to do that in the most responsible way possible, and that means we're doing it according to Association of Medical Research Charities guidance. So we've set up, for example, an independent scientific panel, people who are not uh, actually involved in bone cancer research because we have quite a small community, to get good, to get the best scientists to look at the proposals that come. Having said that, it's really difficult for us to know whether or not the one and a half million quid that's gone on so far is really going to make a difference to patients at the other end. And that's a big challenge is linking those two things up. And you can look at measures of how successful that's been. So, you know, have those researchers gone on to win prizes, which they've done, uh, to publish in high quality scientific journals, which they've done, to go on to attract more research money, uh, which they've done. So those things are all very good, but we're not yet at a point where we've got, you know, any treatment for it. Um, so we've got to keep doing what we're doing, we've got to keep doing more of it. Um, and actually, I'm quite optimistic. I think we're in a situation where, certainly, you know, from my sort of professional side of things, I think we are, all the people who work in this area are talking to each other more than they've ever done before. BCLT is a huge part of that. That's, you know, don't underestimate how important that is. To have patients knocking on the door going, what are you doing? This is unacceptable. It's fantastic. A good example of that is biobanking. We had a biobanking meeting, must be two years ago, um, where patients stood up and said, you know, and Sarah also stood up and said, you know, my son died, but a bit of his tumor was banked, and that makes me happy that he's contributing to the solution in some way. And Andrew Shepard stood up and said, well, you know, none of you bastards asked me for a <laughs> 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 And that was a missed opportunity. You must try harder, you know. We, and I was sitting there going, well, you know, we bank some of them, but we don't bank all of them. And, uh, you know, as of last week, we started banking all of them. So it's taken a while. It's regulated, it's really, in a sense, it's very difficult. Uh, but we've got that. So, yeah, I think it's really important. I don't underestimate what these guys are doing. That's right. And I'm sorry I have to do it for sure. Yeah. We'll let you go. Um, the next question is from Mark, and it's from Carol. And I invite Carol to. Would you like to? Hi, Mark. Can we just use the mic so I can hear it? It's coming behind you. Directly. Carol? No, no, sorry. The mic's coming the right way. Carol's in front of you. Say hello. Put your hand up, Carol. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi. No, I got the mic. No, you have to, so I can hear you. Awesome. Yeah. My son um, is, is really interesting. He was only in swimming before he was now in the Middle East. And then after his diagnosis and a lot of the surgery, he got back into swimming again. And he loved it and he really enjoyed it. 
um, he had a very good relationship with his teacher and everything. It was really good. We were just walked up on. We live in Manchester, I don't know if you know the area, but we live in Manchester and the swimming pool was in Manchester, it was about half an hour away. And we used to go down there and we used to drive in there and we'd have a lesson for half an hour and then we used to drive back. And I wonder, do you know anybody in the Manchester area that would have a like one to one support for a disabled swimming? I think it'd have to be somebody that really got to, which the teacher did. Okay, there's a website for anybody who knows somebody with a disability. Uh, who is interested in sport is called parasport.org.uk. Might have to double check that on the phone. Um, and uh, basically, you put in your disability where you live, and it will give you all the clubs in your area that that's offer support for people with disabilities in, in a given sport. I think you can search in different ways. You can search by sport, search by disability, and it will show you where the nearest clubs are. It's a really good. A really good website. So I would suggest that. But there's certainly more than I lived in Manchester. I trained in central Manchester for 10 years. So there are other pools. Yeah. It's just, and, and there used to be a. Uh, I mean, I, I trained with Olympic swimmers because the level that I was at, but there used to be every Sunday a, a disability group that met at the Aquatic Centre in Manchester. But so. Aquatic Centre is about 10 minutes down the road. Manchester one direction. We've got Stockport Metro in the other. So there's, 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 there is stuff there, but I would definitely go to that website and have a look. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is for Sue and Chantal. Would Can you... we pass the mic over? That, that would be brilliant. Thank you. And just to let everybody know, which is Sue also has to leave um, to, to return home. Half five, yeah. So if anyone else has any questions for her, please prepare yourself. Hi Sue, um, just want to know what's the next step in uh, Ewing's research and what is required to ensure that momentum is maintained? That, that's quite a difficult question to answer because there are lots of different steps at different levels. So one of the things that's happening internationally um, at the moment um, and has been funded through um, Framework 7 European Union um, is a study to look at a series of markers that you can detect in um, blood samples um, in a prospective trial that's open, some of you might know about it, it's in Ewing's patients, Euro Ewing's 2012, and that study um, across Europe is looking at the best way in which we can identify patients who are doing very well with the treatment within that trial and those patients that aren't doing so well so that in the future we might be able to select patients for alternative therapies which is important because not all therapies will work for everybody. So that's one level of research that's actively going on now to try and streamline how we use current therapies more effectively. But of course we all know we need better therapies as well. Um, and so there are new drugs being evaluated and designed. We heard about some possibilities this morning. Um, so chemists looking at molecules that we know kill bone cancer cells but maybe aren't quite right to deliver to patients yet. So modifying the structures of those compounds so that they can get into the body better, be more effective. So that's another level of research. Then it's an area that actually BCRT are funding um, people in my group to do, to work on. It's actually trying to identify the cells that are, if you like, the seeds to drive the cancer. So most of the bone cancers respond to chemotherapy, so they shrink when you treat them, but you don't actually get rid of the tumour completely, and that's the problem. And that's why you have treatment failures and then sadly relapses. And that can sometimes happen quite late in some cancers, urines for example. So we're trying to isolate, actually from patient samples in collaboration with our surgical colleagues who are collecting the samples for us, um, the cells that have the ability to divide and survive on their own and that we believe are driving the growth and the relapse of the cancer. And if we can identify that cell, then we can develop new therapies to kill that cell 
and then hopefully improve um, outcomes for all cancer patients. So three different areas really are the primary. Um, why is it, uh, what is it about human sarcoma that's so difficult to um, identify even after several CT scans and MRI scans? It doesn't surface to the front as quickly. I'm just wondering what is it that it's so slow to detect? So I have to say that I'm probably not the best person to give you an in-depth answer to that question. I am not a radiologist, I'm a radiotherapist, but I do look at plenty of scans in the process of deciding where to treat radiotherapy when we're looking at human sarcoma. And I think when our scans are only so good, you know, they, they have limitations and if there's an obvious lump somewhere where there shouldn't be anything, that's easy to identify. But often with cancers that start in the bone, unless the structure of the bone changes, it's going to be very hard to pick them up on some types of scans and, and therefore often very early cancers are really hard to see. And there's also a lot of mimickers when you look at scans. They're, they're the same appearance could have many different explanations and, and it's a bit like early diagnosis of, of symptoms. Similarly, some appearances on scans may be interpreted the wrong way because it's, people don't have the awareness of what they might imply. Um, and, and bone have a, has a whole biology of itself. It's a constantly changing organ. So bones are all the time repairing themselves, restructuring themselves, and all that activity can also appear abnormal on scans or, or hide some of the abnormal things that are going on. So um, I think we have to recognise that any, any scan at the moment certainly has limitations. And I know that there are also some research at the moment happening looking into different types of scans. You know about PET, PET scans, PET CT scans, and, and certainly it's sometimes not easy to interpret those, but there's lots of different types of markers that you can use for those scans, um, and, and you know we need to research which ones will be the best to help us. Um, and certainly MRI scan is doing, going down a whole new avenue of looking at functional MRI, how changes biology, changes in structures, and, and how that can help us identify abnormalities. So for a non-radiologist, I hope I've, I've given you a little bit of an idea, but it's, it's a challenge, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just add a comment yeah. on that? Because scans um, is one way in which you can detect cancer, um, but one of the things that we're doing internationally um, is, is looking at molecular methods to detect circulating tumour cells. So can we detect the, the cancer actually in the blood or in bone marrow? So these are very much more sensitive methodologies that might allow you to detect a single cancer cell compared to a scan where you really need something that's millimeter, uh, centimeter, least a centimeter, centimeter. Mm -hmm. What keeps you motivated every day waking up in the morning? Um, I think the way I see motivation is, is, is you need to think about what's, in, what's important to you, why you're doing a certain thing. So like when I was swimming, for example, I was motivated by wanting to try and win a gold medal, by uh, being fit and healthy, by the lifestyle, by the team, you know, the camaraderie, and, and by respect for my coach. A whole bunch of different things motivated me to train. Um, I think being an amputee, uh, you need to have to think about, you know, why is it important for you to walk well uh, and to work hard at walking well and, and being, you know, having the lifestyle that you want, because that's what's going to make you stay that extra half an hour at the limpeter sensor. Which, I mean, I, if you're anything like me, I don't want to spend an extra minute in the limpeter sensor if I don't have to. So something about the place is I want to be in and out. Um, but you need, you know, you need to be pretty focused on why you're doing it, and then go back, keep going back, keep going back until it's absolutely right for you. And if it's not right, find another fitter, because it's about a personal relationship as well as it's not just not every fitter is as good as or, or prosthetist is as good as, as the next. So um, I think try to figure out what you want to do in life generally, and then make sure that your your leg is able to let you do that, because you should be able to do anything. Thank you. I, I, very, I, I mean, I, you're a brother in the MIT, so it's, it's obviously different, but I've climbed in the Alps, the Himalayas, I've skied in Antarctica, 
Now, then that petition would stop you. But it might mean a lot of hard work with the process to get it right for you. Thank you. To answer that question, I think it's, it boils down to my personal journey in this field and you know we I started out as an oncologist and, and I I knew I wanted to treat cancer but I didn't particularly have a preference for any specific cancer at the beginning and it's like anything in life you get exposed to certain things and you meet certain people who influence you and who mentors you and the interest develops and the longer you do something if it's if it fits you it, you, you develop that love, and I don't know if any of you know Jeremy Whelan, he calls us sarcoma files, um, as in, you know, this is what we love to do. And I'm very uh, appreciative of the, um, the honour of having this fellowship from the BCRT. Um, it's very hard to do radiotherapy research, to get funding for radiotherapy research. I mean, drugs are where the money is, and, and that's what people will fund. Um, so it's quite hard to get projects like these up and running, and specifically in rare tumours. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are no big up and running bone cancer trials in radiotherapy. So this is such a wonderful opportunity, and you know, this is where my love and, and, and my interest lies, and definitely I'll, I'll remain involved. Absolutely. Hi, Mark. Um, so obviously um, I work at BCRT, so I'm quite interested in the role that we can play. Um, and do you think there is a role for us in promoting sports to people affected by primary bone cancer? And do you have any idea what that could be? Oh, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there is. Um, I, I think, you know, and again, listen to some of the presentations earlier on, that you guys need to be smart about who you collaborate with because there's no point inventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel, because there are organisations out there doing things, like the Parasport website. I mean, you, you could spend however many thousand pounds, you know, helping amputees into sport, or you could give them all the link to the Parasport website. You know, and, and, and they, they've spent a million pounds on the website. So, so yes, there probably are things you can do, but be smart about it. I, I mean, and, and the, the stuff that we were talking about earlier on about um, you know education in schools. I mean, Teenage Cancer Trust do that already. Now, if you want a specific bone uh, bone cancer element to what they're delivering, I'm sure they'd be happy to do it if they're, if they're given the information. Uh, the Youth Sport Trust they have athletes going out, and, and I, I dare say there's Paralympians within there. If you want a bone cancer thing in, in with their school visit, then there's that available. I would, I would think about smart collaboration before you think about starting something up from scratch. How's it going? What do you make of it? Um, it's always an emotional experience. Um, not just your own personal journeys, but certain people speaking right from the heart. Um, I would probably sum it up actually in, in Mark's uh, three things that we learned from Mark that I think we should be taking forward. Um, <clears throat> one is about teamwork and understanding that we can be much bigger than the sum of our parts, and that's not just from a trusty person, but a trusty man, it is, it is right way across. So that's the first real thing. The second thing I think is about um, best outcome. I thought it was really, really hit hard about constantly reviewing what we're doing in a very open and mature way because we've all got that same best outcome in mind. And I think that is absolutely crucial for us. And thirdly, not by any means the least, is keep a sense of humour. Sense of humour. So, sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs>